Good morning. How is everybody? Hey, I want to I want to just kind of jump on one thing that Chris said in terms of next Sunday, Easter Sunday. We've got a giveaway that we're going to do for each family, a book that was um, written by a detective who was a cold case detective, and it was his take on the resurrection. He basically wanted to look at the resurrection as a cold case and go back and reestablish the facts and try and determine um, whether Jesus really did raise from the dead or not. And, um, and he was a skeptic. That was his purpose in doing that. And uh, he ended up becoming a believer in the reality of the resurrection. And so uh, just a little book that we're going to give away next week, and we hope you'll be here for that. If you've got some friends that um, say, yeah, Easter, uh, it's probably been just a big fairy tale, have them come and, and get a copy of the book. That will be great. Um, well, I want to do one thing before we uh, really jump into the message today. We're glad that you're watching online. Thanks for being here, um, everybody who's in the house as well. Um, we've prayed a lot for Ukraine, for what's going on in Ukraine. One of our other missionaries, um, Denise and, and Laminda Ubeyawansha, say that uh, several times really fast, um, are in Sri Lanka, and I don't know if you've watched the news or not, but there's a tremendous amount of turmoil in Sri Lanka right now. There's uh, some issues with, with uh, the government and, and um, people who are protesting, and the government has basically shut everything down and really paralyzed the country. I, um, I communicated with, with um, Laminda this week, and he sent me this text. He said, hi, Pastor Rick, the whole country is, is in real bad financial crisis, and the people have gone to the streets and are asking the president and his government to go home. Unfortunately, this greedy, heartless people but the, uh, are trying to keep their power in place somehow. He's talking about the government. So the protests are accelerating every day, and people have no gas, propane, and the power cuts off over 10 hours each day. To say, that, to say the least, we are in the worst situation. We need your prayers for some good leadership to take over and, and to go to the International Money Fund and find some solutions. As for our family, we too are facing the same challenges that all of the people are facing. Our propane gas is almost gone, and I have a small extra tank that I'm trying to fill it with, but have found no place to be able to do so. I've been trying for over three weeks now to fill the propane tank. There are long lines for petrol. I do have a small bike I use most of the time to go to ministry and other stuff. It's tough times, yet we hope for a better future and continue our, our ministry with people that need our help like never before. Please ask the church to pray for us to adjust to this new and hard conditions and, and still keep the positive to give hope for hopeless people in this country. Um, so I, I just want us to pray for a second. Denise and Laminda, if you want to write a note, um, the, the, um, uh, just to remind you to pray for them this week, the, the next several weeks. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way, that you, um, the way that you brought our lives together with Denise and Laminda. Um, God, it, it's just been such a cool thing to see your hand in that. And right now, Lord, we, we come to you asking that you would provide for them just what they need and that you would use your work in their lives to touch lots and lots of other people's. Um, uh, Father, be with the people that they minister to and, um, and in a way that only you can meet their needs at just the right time and just the right moment to, to draw attention to you, to bring glory to you. And God, our prayer is that many would come to know you um, through, through your work there, through, through Laminda and Denise, through, through their, their mission. Um, God, watch over and protect them, provide for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, Chris mentioned Holy Week. I just want to review a little bit. We're in this series called Jesus Is, and it's, uh, it really takes place in the, in the uh, it starts a, a number of weeks ahead of time, um, but then really has focused on the week before the crucifixion and resurrection. And each of our messages have, been, uh, have featured some aspect about who Jesus is and what's going on in his life. So um, some four to six weeks, maybe a couple of months um, before, uh, before Passover, Jesus goes and raises Lazarus from the dead. And we talked in that message about Jesus is power over death. Jesus has power over death. He's going to prove that in other ways, but he proved it with Lazarus. 
On Saturday night, a week before Passover, Jesus goes to have dinner, probably at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. Jesus is eating dinner with them. Mary comes out and anoints Jesus' head with incredibly expensive uh, perfume and oil. And uh, we talked about Jesus being worthy that day. That Jesus is worthy. That was Saturday night. On Sunday, um, that it's today, right? The triumphal entry. It's, uh, it's when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. He comes from, from Bethany, makes that, that journey into Jerusalem on the donkey. Um, and and uh, we talked about Jesus being king, that his his procession into Jerusalem was all about the kingship of Jesus. On, um, on Monday, on, on the next day, Jesus um, is heading down into the temple. He passes a fig tree that, that uh, he expects to eat some, some pagam, some, some small figs off. There aren't any figs. Jesus curses the fig tree. He goes into the temple. He turns over the, ta- the, the tables in the temple, not because he's hungry, not because he's mad, but because they've lost sight of who God is and that they've take the, the money changers and all of the stuff associated with sacrifice had taken over the place for the Gentiles. We, 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 uh, that message was Jesus is serious. Last week, we talked about what happens on Thursday night um, when Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples. Um, and that, and that the, the theme of that message was that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice for us. Today's message that we're going to get to takes place after the Passover, but before the trials. On Friday night at our Good Friday service, we're, we're going to be talking about that, about what Jesus went through in the trials and in his crucifixion. And then next Sunday, we're going to celebrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're going to celebrate. Jesus is alive, right? He's risen. Yeah, we're practicing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Um, um, Luke 22 says something interesting when, as I was studying this week, that during this week, every day Jesus was probably going into the temple to teach. So on Monday, when he goes into the temple and he passes the fig tree and he, and he ultimately clears out the temple, um, that was his practice. Prob- on Tuesday, he walks by that fig tree that he had cursed and it's all shriveled up. He's walking back to the temple to, to, uh, to do more teaching. On Wednesday, he probably went into the temple to teach. Somewhere in there, Tuesday, Wednesday, I, I think probably after Jesus had turned over the, the tables in the temple, Judas goes to the Sanhedrin and says, I'll betray Jesus. And they have that interaction. We're not exactly sure um, at what point in time that happens, but it happens during that week. Um, last week, last week we read about the Passover and that in the middle of that meal, Jesus says, one of you is going to be, be one of you is going to betray me. And everybody says, is it me? They, uh, who is it? They, they go through that process and Jesus says, it's, it's going to be the one who puts his hand in the bowl with me, who dips his bread in the bowl with me. And Judas does that in the midst of all kinds of conversation. People notice, but they don't really connect those dots that Judas is who it's going to be until afterwards. I, I say all that to say this, Jesus knew what was going to happen in the next 24 hours. He knew what was going to happen what he was facing that night. How, how would you react? How would you live? What would you do if you knew that you had 24 hours left to live? What would you do with your life? What conversations would you have? Um, you know, as I was kind of thinking through that, two memorable pictures stick, stuck in my mind as I was thinking about this for the sermon. The first is this. Um, on, on D-Day, on the beaches of Normandy in World War II, as those soldiers approached that beach, knowing that their chances of survival were, were minimal, what were the conversations that they were having? What were the things that they were thinking? What were the letters that they were writing at that point in time? The other picture that's in my mind is, is from the movie Glory, if you saw that. It's, uh, it's been a number of years ago. But in that movie, the 54th uh, Infantry Regiment from Massachusetts um, is this, this, uh, this regiment of black soldiers in the Civil War that um, train and do all kinds of stuff and, and don't really get to go into battle until they're called to go to Fort Wagner in, in, um, in uh, outside Charleston, South Carolina. And they, they volunteer, the, the regiment volunteers to attack this fort from the beach where they're completely exposed. 
the likelihood that they're all going to die is very real. And there is this scene in the movie, do you, I, I don't know if you've seen this, if you remember it, where the night before they're around the campfire and they're singing together and encouraging each other and talking together about how they want to remain faithful as they, as they move towards probably their death. They were willing to sacrifice themselves, willing to die because they knew that their role in that battle might ultimately result in freedom for their children, for their descendants. That takes us to Jesus on the night of Passover. He celebrates together with his closest friends, knowing that his time has come. Do you know how Jesus and the disciples ended the Passover? They sang, which is really interesting. Matthew 26 says this. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is at the very end after Jesus has said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is poured out for you. It says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is not a uh, significant point in my message this morning. This is just something I want to throw in, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot over the last several, uh, over the last several months. Um, it's this, singing has, singing together has, the pow, has a tremendous power in our lives. Um, it, it has the ability to encourage people. It has the ability to unify people. It has the ability to comfort people. And we don't do it often enough. At the beginning of March, Jake and I were at a conference in, in Orlando, a conference of about 7,000 church leaders who care a lot about church planting. Um, and it, it's a conference that I've gone to probably for the last 12 or 14 years. It's a great, great place. People come from all kinds of denominational backgrounds, all kinds of churches, large and small. And whenever we're together there, the worship's great. It's, it's just incredible. This year, um, there were 7,000 um, church leaders who were there in this room together. And the worship started, and it was terrific. But about halfway through that very first session, the worship leader um, began to sing a song that's a song from the 80s that probably most of us had not sung for a really long time. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul rejoice. And all of a sudden, with these 7,000 church leaders, everything changed. The presence of God was there in a really powerful way as people together focused entirely on Jesus without any distractions. Um, so much so that the worship leader had to get out of the way, off mic, and just let people sing to God. Why did Jesus and the disciples sing at the end of the Passover I don't think it was just simply because it was a part of their liturgy. Oh, we sing a song at the end of the service kind of like we do. I don't think it was that at all. I think that Jesus knew that, that together as they sang, that their hearts would be knitted together, that they would encourage each other. I think Jesus needed that to, to sing together. I just want to encourage you. Man, when we're together to worship, jump in, participate not just for yourself, but for the people who are around you. Last week, I said to Mark before the service, um, earlier that week, Thursday night, I had gone to see Hamilton. I had gone to see Hamilton at the Wharton Center. And I said to Mark last Sunday morning, I am so ready to worship. And he said, oh, that's cool. Why? And I said, because I can't get Hamilton out of my mind. I can't get the music out of my mind. And I need to worship to just refocus my thoughts. To be able to think about the presence of God, we, we need to sing. Um, so they sang together and they, and they went to the Mount of Olives. Let me do just a little bit of, of teaching here for a second. Uh, here's the city of Jerusalem with the, with the uh, walls around the city. Just really quick overview. The, probably where the upper room was, was in this section of the city of Jerusalem. There's the temple that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And the journey down through the Kidron Valley over to the Mount of Olives. They probably came this way. It's possible that they could have walked in this way through the gates and out the city that way. It was probably about a mile to a mile and a half for them from the, from the upper room to the Mount of Olives. 
um, to the Garden of Gethsemane. That would have taken them probably 20 or 30 minutes after they celebrated Passover. And it's interesting to me that Luke tells us, uh, you know, when you think, why did they go to the Garden of Gethsemane? Luke says, that's what Jesus usually did. That's the place that he went. And so they went together with him. That leads us into this passage of scripture that, that we're gonna take a look at. Um, it's important to know the Mount of Olives. You've got the city of Jerusalem that's kind of like this, the Kidron Valley that's down this way. The, the uh, Mount of Olives is on the other side of the Kidron Valley, and the Garden of the Gethsemane is kind of down towards the bottom of the Mount of Olives. It's down closer to the river. It would have been a quiet place without a lot of distractions. Here's the story from Matthew, chapter 26, beginning in verse 31. Jesus told them this very night, he's, he's talking to the disciples, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into, into Galilee. Um, if I can fast forward just for a second, and you know the story do you remember when Jesus talks to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. When, where's that interaction take, take place? It takes place on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus says on the night that he's going to be betrayed, hey, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead of you to Galilee and I'm going to see you there. Um, but it's easy to miss what he said in there as well. Jesus, just hours before his betrayal, says, after I have risen. The disciples hear all that. They hear everything that Jesus says, that he's gonna see him in Galilee, that he says, after I've risen, but what do they focus on? They focus on the fact that Jesus has said, you're gonna be scattered like sheep. Verse 33, Peter replies, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Everyone is so confident that they won't run. Everyone, they've spent three years with Jesus, right? Everybody is so so sure of their relationship with him that, that they won't run even though Jesus tells them, this is what's gonna happen. This is what you're gonna do. Here's a, here's a real critical question for you to wrestle with today. Do you trust yourself more than you trust Jesus? Jesus says to the disciples, you're all gonna scatter. And the disciples say, no, we're not gonna scatter. We know us. I know what I believe. I know who I know. I would never do that. Jesus says, you're gonna scatter. Do you trust yourself more than you trust Jesus? I think, I think that's such an important question for us to come to grips with because we can never grow in our walk with Jesus if we don't take him at his word as more powerful, more authoritative than our own wants, wishes, and desires. Verse 36, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sour, sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus has walked this, these 20 minutes, 30 minutes from where they celebrate the Passover down into the, the bottom of the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says to the eight disciples, you guys stay here. You guys, you guys just hang here. And then he goes a little bit further with Peter, James, and John. Peter and, and these two brothers. Um, and he tells them, he tells Peter, James, and John, I'm overwhelmed to the point of death. Have, have you ever had a conversation with somebody where they tell you something gut-wrenching and you just kind of go, oh, okay, and walk away? Have you ever been the one who exposes yourself, who, who shares something that's 
going on deep inside you that's incredibly tar- troubling. And people say, oh, yeah, okay. I, you know what? I need to go talk to that person. I think that was Jesus' experience here in the garden. He says to these guys that he's the closest to, man, I need you so badly. Stay here with me. Watch and pray. We don't know how big the Garden of Gethsemane was at this point in time in history. We can't really tell that for sure. That There is a Garden of Gethsemane that's still at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. If you go to Israel, you can walk through it. And it's a beautiful place. It's well manicured. I don't think it's, that's probably what it was like when Jesus was there. I think it was, it was probably filled with trees. But it was a, a place that could be quiet. Where there would be few distractions. Um, Luke tells us that that Jesus took Peter, James, and John a stone's throw away from the other eight disciples. Um, So the question is, how far can you throw a stone? You know, once upon a time, I could throw a stone pretty good. uh, A stone's throw for me right now might just be to the back of the auditorium. Um, But this is, he probably takes them 50 or 60 yards away. You know, if, if you're in pretty good shape, if you're young, you can throw a stone 150 yards. 150 feet without too much trouble. Jesus separates from them so that he could pray without any distractions, without any interruptions. Jesus was struggling. Um, Matthew says he was sorrow, sorrowful, full of sorrow. He needed the presence of his closest friends. Verse 39, going a little farther from the place that he leaves Peter, James, and John, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. You know, in in this interaction, in this first interaction that Jesus has with God, just hours before he's going to be betrayed, there are some really interesting things in the text. Um, uh, Mark and Luke both ju- both just say that Jesus says Father. Mark says something interesting that we're going to take a look at in a second. But Matthew says that Jesus said My Father. There was a there was a, a a level of intimacy, a recognition of the relationship that he had with God. That in his deepest time of need, he, he was saying, he said, "My Dad, I need you." Um, wh- why did Jesus ask? for the cup to be taken away. I know it's, it's easy to just kind of think for a second and say, oh, certainly he was gonna die. He didn't want to experience that. Why did he ask that? Because Jesus was fully human. Jesus was human. He, he didn't want to experience his physical death. He didn't want to be physically beaten in the way that he would be. He didn't want to experience that separation from God that he was going to experience. But because of his great love for you, because of his love for me, Jesus said, God, if you can take it away, please do. But if not, it's your will, not mine. Mark describes the same same scene with just a little bit different flavor. Mark 14 Um, verse 35 and 36 say this, going a little farther, just like Matthew said, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father. He said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Most of the time when we talk um, you know, in the context of the church, and we talk about the use of the word Abba. We, we talk about it from Romans and, and this concept that we have this relationship with God where we can call him Abba Father. Abba is, in the, in the um, original language, it's the word for daddy. It's a very personal, intimate, close kind of a word. We tend to think of it in that passage in Romans. That's where it is. But Jesus, on the night that he's gonna be betrayed, says as he's praying, Daddy, Daddy, can't you fix this for me? Again, if you look at the posture that Jesus takes in this, he falls face down on the ground. He, it's, it's, a, it's a place of complete humility that he says, God, please, 
please intervene. Luke adds even a little bit different flavor to this same point in the text. In Luke 22, verse 43, it says this, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed even more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Um, hematidrosis is the, is the medical term for an extreme condition that happens really rarely where blood comes out through a person's pores. Um, it, 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 th there aren't lots of cases of it. It's the kind of thing that, that happens um, you know, once every, every uh, uh, age almost, that kind of thing. But it's a, it's a medically documented condition that happens. It typically happens when a person is under extreme and intense pressure. It's interesting to me that Luke says, Jesus comes, he's full of sorrow. He says to his closest friends, stay here and pray with me. And, and goes off, to him, off by himself to pray. And he does. And he's just so wrung out in that that an angel comes and ministers to him, gives him strength. And in his strengthened condition by the angel, he prays even more intensely. And Luke says it's at that point that he sweat drops like drops of blood. Um, what does Jesus do with that increased strength that comes from the angel? He prays even more earnestly. And verse 40 of back in Matthew 26 says this. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. When you look at that, do you think, why did Jesus ask Peter? Why didn't he ask Peter, James, and John? Why didn't he ask John? Why didn't he ask James? Why, didn't he, why did he ask Peter? Because Peter was the one who had said, Lord, no matter what, I'm not gonna turn my back on you. Everybody else may scatter, it's not going to be me. Um, again, Mark has an interesting view of what happens here. Um, Mark 14 says this, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If you flash back to Matthew chapter 16, um, something interesting happens. Jesus is talking to the disciples. They're in Caesarea Philippi near a pagan temple. And Jesus says, um, who do people think I am? And, and the disciples say, some, some think you're Jeremiah. Some think you're one of the prophets. Um, but some, some think you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. And Jesus says to them, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. And Jesus says, um, you're, you're Simon, but your name is gonna be changed to Peter, to the rock. And on that truth, I'm gonna build my church. You now, Simon, are, are rocky. You're, you're solid. Peter is this huge personality. He's this person that responds in an instant. He's the guy who walks on the water, that kind of thing. But he doesn't always get it right. And in this situation, Peter falls asleep. And Mark says that Jesus' interaction with Jesus is really interesting. He returns to the disciples and finds them sleeping and says, Simon. He doesn't call him Peter at that point in time. I don't know about you. But uh, when I was a kid, um, people called me something different than they call me now. They called me Ricky, little Ricky Ruble. <laughs> Can you picture that in your mind? Um, that changed when I was probably eight or 10 years old. It's no longer Ricky, it's Rick, right? Um, so I, know where, I know what's gonna happen now. Oh, pastor, my pastor, Pastor Ricky, uh, that, right? Um, that's, that's where it's all gonna go. Um, here, here's, here's the thing, though. When I was with my family, if I would do something stupid as an adult, my sisters, sometimes my mom and dad would say, Ricky, 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 
Right? Anybody experience that? It's like you, when, when you mess up, you go back to that childhood name where you're young and stupid. Um, I think that's what happened. Jesus said, you're asleep. Simon, you're not being who I called you to be. You're not living up to, to who you really are. Simon, you got to get it together. Peter falls asleep. He doesn't live, live up to that rocky name. Um, verse 42, Jesus went away a second time and prayed. Again, my father, my father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. Verse 43, when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the th same thing. Mark, Mark says this, he went away a second time and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They didn't know what to say to him. I, I say that to just, again, paint the picture of what Jesus went through this night. He, he goes away and he prays, and he comes back and they're sleeping. He says, why are you sleeping? I need you to watch and pray. And then Jesus goes and prays again. Simon, Simon, or Peter, James, and John are awake at that point. They fall asleep again. Jesus comes back after the second time, and they're asleep. And at this point, there is no conversation. I think Jesus just looked at them. They're groggy. They look up, and there is this awkward silence. It just sat there. And then Jesus goes to pray again. Under, I say that to just help you understand the humanity of Jesus, the disappointment that he would have experienced in the garden that night, the grief as he needed his closest friends to walk with him through that time, and they fell asleep. Jesus was human, just like us. Verse 45 then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look and, and resting. Look, the hour has come and the son of man is delivered into the hand of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Have you ever heard somebody say bad things come in threes? I don't know where that, where the, where that uh, idea comes from, but it's interesting to me that Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock grows. And three times, Peter, James, and John fall asleep on Jesus in his deepest hour of need. Three times. And Jesus is in the grave for three days. I think that there's some connection in there. I don't know how to connect all those dots, but there was something powerful in that. Here's, here's what I want you to walk away with out of today's, out of today's talk. Don't miss this. Jesus was human. He experienced loneliness. He experienced dread. He experienced distress. He experienced severe disappointment in his closest friends. Jesus didn't want to experience what he was going to go through. Get a hold of this. Jesus was not a robot. He was not an optimist at this point in his life. He was not a happy-go-lucky guy that just went around singing, don't worry, be happy. That was not Jesus' experience as he approached his death. Because of that reality, because of that truth, we can't say Jesus doesn't understand what it's like to face death. We can't say, Jesus doesn't understand what it's like to face insurmountable odds when you have a child, a spouse, a sibling, a parent that's facing death. We can't say, Jesus doesn't understand what it's like to be put in a place where you know you're walking into a volatile situation that's going to blow up and you have to go in anyway. We can't say that because Jesus does understand he experienced it. He experienced it for our behalf because of his love for us. If you're in crisis this morning, if you don't 
want to face the future. Know that Jesus understands and he's walked this path already. He will guide you through it. Second, second truth is just, this is all kind of packed together. Jesus has gone where you're going. We will all face death. We will all face death. It may come through a disease. It may be through some catastrophic event like a car accident. It may be that, that, we, that our body just simply wears out. But Jesus has been there. He can guide us through that journey. He can walk with us. He can show us a plan of how to navigate those waters. We don't have to do it alone, and we don't have to fear that we'd do it alone. Um, as, I, as I looked at this whole passage and, and just thought, you know, it's, uh, we see Jesus in this time of grief. What can we learn? What did Jesus do with his closest friends? Um, how did Jesus face the crisis that he knew was coming? I think when you look at the passage, the, the first thing that, that he did was that he warned the disciples. Even before they came to Jerusalem, Jesus said, we're going to Jerusalem and, and I'm going to die. His disciples said, you don't want to go back there. They're going to kill you. And Jesus said, no, that's, that's why I came. I came to seek and save the lost. Jesus warned his disciples ahead of time. Earlier that night, as they, as they make that journey into the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, after I've risen, he's saying, I'm going to die. He warned them. The second thing is this. He, Jesus invited his disciples to share the burden. And then he accepted it when they didn't. I think when we face a crisis, we, we need to warn the people around us. We need to tell them what's going on in our life. And we need to invite them in to walk with us through that process. But not to, be, not, not to go crazy if they don't walk through that with us. Jesus invited the disciples to share the burden. But he accepted it when they didn't. The third thing, Jesus asked God to intervene, but ultimately he accepted his plan. Jesus said, God, please take this cup from me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to experience what I'm going to experience, but not my will, but yours. When, when we face crisis, when we face things that we think are too big, we need to ask God, God, would you just deliver me from this? But if you don't, I'm willing to walk with you where you lead. I will follow where you lead. I will go where you tell me to go. Not my will, but yours. And the last thing that I think Jesus did in this crisis is that he ultimately leaned into the situation. I, I think that there's something incredibly powerful as Jesus is just wrung out from talking to God saying, God, please take this from me. Please take this from me as he prays. And finally, he says to his disciples, to Peter, to Peter, James, and John, it's time to wake up. Here comes my betrayer. He faced what was going on. He didn't try to run. He didn't try to escape. He leaned in to what God had called him to. Last thing's this. You're not alone. Know that you're not alone. No matter what you're going through this morning, you're not alone um, why does Jesus' humanity matter? Because it helps us know that we're not alone, that we've not been abandoned in a time of crisis. Jesus promised that he would send the Holy Spirit. He's, he said to his disciples, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send a comforter to walk with you through this time. Um, there's, there's a danger for us in reading about Jesus celebrating the Passover, reading about Jesus praying in the garden, and, and just kind of sterilizing those events. We see da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper where all the disciples are, you know, kind of in clean clothes on one side of the table. Everybody's at their place. And yeah, they're asking the question, is it me? Is it me? But it just looks like a nice kind of meal with just a little bit on the table. We think about the disciples celebrating the Passover, and we, and we kind of visualize that in their mind, and we miss the fact that a Passover lamb is killed, that his neck is sliced, and that his, he bleeds out, and that he's sacrificed. And we miss that 266,000 Passover lambs were killed in Jerusalem at Passover time. 
We think about Jesus praying in the garden and we have this picture in our mind of, of, the, of that uh, painting from, from Montenegro where, where Jesus is there with his hands clasped and the moon is kind of shining down on him and he has, he's looking up to heaven and it looks so nice. And we miss the fact that Jesus was, was wrestling with God in that moment. Again, as, as I was just kind of processing through this event, it took me back to a life group that we were part of about 15 years ago. One of the guys in the life group had lost his job. He was depressed. He felt, he felt worthless, like he couldn't take care of his family. And he felt like everything was falling apart. His health was bad. And as we began to pray that night, um, I will, I'll never forget what it was like. Because we're praying, and you know, when you pray in life group, everybody kind of says their prayer, and that's all good. And that night, John just, ah! He, he literally began to sob and, and to just, from the inside of his depths, cry out to God. He needed help. That's the picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was more than just, God, not, not my world, but yours. Jesus poured himself out because he was fully human. That's so important because unless he was fully human, he couldn't take our sin on himself and die for us. That's the power of the gospel. And that's why you gotta be here for the resurrection next week. Let's, let's pray. Lord, um, thank you for the picture that your word gives us of Jesus' grief and loneliness, of his pain and hurt. God, we thank you that he would go through that for us. In his name we pray, amen.